The Honorable Gunnar Bergne, Berge, Chairman of the Norwegian Nobel Committee, members of the committee, fellow Nobel laureates, and distinguished guests. First of all, allow me to say that I am very pleased to be able to join you in congratulating the Norwegian Nobel Committee on its centennial. I would also like to applaud the Norwegian Nobel Committee for its outstanding work that it has accomplished during the past 100 years. I have nothing but the highest praises for the committee. Above all, I would like to say that it is an incomparable honor for me to have this opportunity to speak before you from this privileged podium. Distinguished guests, in the wake of the terrorist attacks on the United States, the world has shown great concern for peace. On the occasion of the centennial of the Nobel Peace Prize, it is most significant and timely for us to look back on the issue of war and peace, peace in the past century and to ponder about peace and the welfare of humanity in the 21st century. In the past 20th century, there were more than 250 wars of various sizes around the world. As a result, an astounding 110 million people lost their lives, of which about 60 percent, or 63 million people, were civilians. There were two main causes for war in the 20th century. One was nationalism, or the confrontation of nationalism, and the other was ideology. There were confrontations among ideologies. The confrontation caused by nationalism swept the world in the first half of the 20th century. Humankind experienced such confrontations through two world wars. And even today, world peace is threatened by ethnic confrontation in some parts of the Middle East. The confrontation caused by ideology, too, brought the East-West Cold War for more than 40 years, and this includes the Korean War in 1950. And even today, the remnants of the Cold War still exist on the Korean Peninsula. Aside from nationalism and ideology, conflicts between races, religions, and cultures are occurring in various places around the world. Terrorists, as can be seen in the case of the U.S. terrorist attack, are trying to justify their attacks on religious grounds. Ladies and gentlemen, we ardently hope that the 20th, 21st century will be a century of peace. World peace is the noblest goal of all humanity. It is the supreme task that must be accomplished at any cost. If we are to forge the 21st century into a peaceful era, we must first correctly grasp what menaces peace today. Then the international community must make common efforts to eliminate such menaces. And so I would like to express my ideas briefly on these issues. In the history of the world, there have been five epochal evidence, events until now. First was the birth of the human species. Second was the emergence of agrarian civilizations some 10,000 years ago. Third was the birth of four great civilizations along the Nile, the Tigris, Euphrates, the Indus, and the Yellow Rivers some five to 6,000 years ago. Fourth was the revolution in thought that took place in China, India, Greece, and Israel 2,500 years ago. Excuse me.
And fifth was the Industrial Revolution that began at the end of the 18th century. The Industrial Revolution laid the economic foundation for the emergence of modern nations. At the same time, it prepared the way for full-fledged nationalism. Stronger people did not hesitate to proceed on the path toward aggressive nationalism, namely imperialism, while weaker people resorted to a strategy of defensive nationalism. Confrontation between them resulted in the tragedy of two world wars in the 20th century. The Industrial Revolution, no doubt, brought development and great affluence to civilization. But at the same time, behind it were the dark shadows of the miserable sacrifices of weaker people, as well as the wars of imperialism of stronger nations. Ladies and gentlemen, what then will be the bright areas and shadows of the age of information and globalization in the 21st century, the age of the sixth epochal event? The information revolution, known as the third wave, opens the door to the new possibilities of knowledge-based economies. Knowledge and information have emerged as the core elements of creating wealth. Poor nations and poor people are now able to take part in the creation of new wealth if they are able to make good use of computers. This is the new paradigm that will help us overcome the limitations of industrial societies which were dependent on the tangible elements of land, capital and labor. At the same time, because of the flow of enormous amounts of information, which overcome restrictions of time and space, the process of globalization is accelerated further. In particular, the establishment of the World Trade Organization in 1995 heralded the opening of full-fledged globalization. Goods and services, as well as capital, now flow freely across national borders within what has now become truly the global village. All of humankind is able to come closer to each other and greater wealth can be created. All these things are the bright side of the age of, of information and globalization. Behind this light, however, is a dark shadow. This is none other than the digital divide. The nations that have economic power derived from information capabilities are overwhelming the economies of developing countries. In the age of knowledge-based economies, the gap in information capabilities among nations created a rapidly widening gulf between the rich, rich and poor. If we ignore this phenomenon, the gap between the advanced and developing nations will be widened further. Behind the destructive fundamental, fundamentalism that is occurring in various places in the world today, or the anti-globalization movement, is anger over the gap between the rich and poor. Moreover, Worldwide environmental degradation will be accelerated if the digital divide triggers excessive development by developing nations as a means of survival. Whenever there have been international conferences of various kinds, we have witnessed violent demonstrations by those who were angered by the gap between the rich and poor and social inequality, which is a side effect of globalization. We cannot guarantee world peace in the 21st century unless there is a resolution of the gap between the rich and poor. Nuclear weapons or missiles will not be completely effective because how war is waged today is changing. War against terrorism is the problem now. The terrorist attacks on the United States last September have fundamentally changed the concept of war. Terrorism is war without a declaration of war. We do not know when or where it will occur. 
We do not know what kind of weapons will be used. It kills civilians indiscriminately. International laws or treaties are useless. Private life as we know it cannot be maintained. We cannot even fly with peace of mind. We cannot go up a high-rise building or open our mail without being anxious. We must eradicate such cowardly, cruel, and barbaric terrorist acts. But we must solve the root cause of terrorism in the long run while meeting out immediate punishment against terrorists. The gap between the rich and poor is the foundation of religious, cultural, racial, and ideological conflicts. All humanity must share the benefits from enhanced information capabilities and globalization. The interests and diversity of all nations and all peoples must be respected. We must not expect poor nations and poor people to be patient forever. I urge the international community to hold serious and active discussions on these issues. At the same time, human rights and democracy must be respected and realized as universal values. I am convinced that when the problems of the poor are resolved and democracy is put into practice, world peace in the 21st century will be possible and all of humankind will be safe and happy. More than anyone, we, the Nobel Peace Laureates, must take the lead in such efforts. Distinguished guests, finally, I would like to touch on the issue of the Korean Peninsula that remains as the last remnant of the Cold War of the 20th century. Peace on the Korean Peninsula is not only the ardent wish of the 70 million Korean people, but is also directly linked to peace in East Asia and the world. Since I was inaugurated President of the Republic of Korea in 1998, I have consistently pushed the Sunshine Policy. It aims, the Sunshine Policy aims at preparing for eventual peaceful unification by accomplishing coexistence and peaceful interaction between South and North Korea. All nations and all peace-loving organizations, including the United Nations, are currently supporting this policy. I visited Pyongyang in June last year and held a historic inter-Korean summit meeting with Chairman Kim Jong-il of North Korea's National Defense Commission. We agreed not to repeat the tra tragedy of war but to make joint efforts for exchanges and cooperation. Since then, tensions have eased greatly and a lot of positive changes have occurred on the Korean Peninsula. Exchanges and cooperation between the South and North have proceeded rapidly at times and slowly at other times. On September 15th, only four days after the terrorist attacks on the United, Na on the United States, inter-Korean ministerial talks were held in Seoul, and ten agreements were reached concerning reuni reunions of separated families, the relinking of a railway, and other projects. In view of the international developments at the time, they were no small feat. Although inter-Korean relations are in a stalemate now, I, along with my people, am convinced that the path toward success will open again without fail if we make our utmost efforts with patience and consistency. I believe there is no alternative to the Sunshine Policy. The Sunshine Policy is a win-win policy that contributes to peace and safety, not only in South and North Korea, but also the entire world. I hope that you will lend us your continued support. Distinguished guests, now I would like to reach my conclusion. The 20th century was an age of world wars, the Cold War, and various armed conflicts around the world. Amid such conditions, however, we have never given up hope for peace. 
After the First World War, the League of Nations was formed. After, second, after the Second World War, the United Nations that could be described as an accumulation of the wishes and efforts of humanity was formed. The role of the Norwegian Nobel Committee over the past 100 years in spreading the message of peace throughout the world by awarding the prize has been commendable indeed. Our advancement toward peace will continue in the 21st century. The driving force of such progress, I believe, will be dialogue and cooperation. I have no doubt that humankind will be able to cope wisely with the new issues of the 21st century, including the problem of poverty. We must keep forging cooperative relations between nations, cultures, religions, and races through dialogue. Where there is dialogue, there is understanding. Where there is understanding, there is cooperation. Where there is cooperation, we can expect a resolution of the problem of poverty. When these things are realized, the threat of war will disappear. The preamble of the UNESCO Constitution reads, Wars begin in the minds of men. Let us wipe the thought of war from our mind. Let us proceed on the path of dialogue and cooperation. Thus, let us leave a proud record in history that will define the 21st century as an age of peace and common prosperity of all humanity. Thank you.